good afternoon, or good evening, or good morning, whenever you're watching this or listening to this. My name's Kevin Graham, and welcome to your Wednesday bulletin. And today, I'm only joined by one of the amigos, it's Brian. Brian, how are you getting on the day? I'm great, mate. Good, how are you? Ah, not too bad, not too bad. I'll bring in Paddy. Paddy Laverty comes in right away. Afternoon, Brian calling him Plug. Now, I read that as Pug. I thought he was talking to me about Pug for the Bar Street kids, but he's obviously he's obviously calling me Pug because I always plug my book. So there you go, we're 30 settings in, and I've already decided to plug my book. Thank you very much, Paddy. I hope you actually bought a copy, Paddy, because you keep on going on about it. Uh, Colin, Colin's not here today, and nobody should worry, he is going to be back, but he's actually in Amsterdam. He's decided yeah, to... He's sass- actually getting mission for Axel, isn't he? He's not a uh, scary for Axel. He's actually decided to sack us off, Brian, and go to Amsterdam, eh? Shocking, he's, mate. Shocking. But he's, but he's, he's been spending a day in Amsterdam instead of being on with us. Crazy. I know. I mean, he was saying it was, he's saying it's work. I mean, I'm putting the inverted air quotes there. He's saying it's work. I mean, my work only sends me to Alwa, not to Amsterdam. So I'm not 100% sure what he's actually on, on about there. But eh, Colin will be back next week, hopefully, if he gets out of Amsterdam. Eh... I'm going to bring up this one. Honey, Paddy and Kevin go large. Oh, well. <laughs> Aye, maybe. Right, what we're going to talk about today, but before we start talking about any, anything, yeah, we've got nearly 200 viewers on, the, on here right away. I want you to hit the like button. Before you put in another comment and all of that, I want you to hit the like button below and subscribe as well, because our subscriber base is absolutely growing. And if you hit the like button, it does actually help. It puts us into the algorithm, takes over and puts us into places where we should be. Uh, so hit like just now. I want to see you all hitting that like button and then we'll move on. What we're going to talk about today, Brian, we've got the tagline, should Ange forget about Europe this season and concentrate on the league? Uh, so that means we'll talk about uh, the European game tomorrow night and also the game against Hibs. We want to have a wee talk about the low knees and the young players that actually might that actually might make a difference this season going, in, going, into, going into next season. We're going to allow ourselves to dream, eh? Dream that if we win the league, are we in a better position this summer? Uh, is the infrastructure there this summer to actually kick on? next year and also we're going to have a wee like not the 10 o'clock news and I think we'll start there we'll start with not the 10 o'clock news which we actually just go through some of the news stories which is making which is making the Celtic headlines today now two minutes 57 Brendan Rogers clacks on that is the Brendan that is the Brendan Rogers clacks on because it was three years ago this week that he left Celtic I found out today, and it seems at times flew, Brian. Eh? Time has really flew. I, I wouldn't have thought that was three years ago. It's crazy. It's weird. It's sort of. It feels both like a long time ago, and I can still, I still remember the morning when the, the news came through that, and he was pictured in Leicester's ground, and it seemed so surreal at the time. And I remember the sort of rage and uproar, and it seemed like the worst thing to happen to Celtic for a long time. And then the following season happened, and then the following season happened. So, uh, you know, I think what it does is it contextualises how good a job Ange has done so far. Because if you look at, you know, when, when Brendan left, and I think Neil Lennon was the right man to see over the line get through the last few games, but then we you know what happened after that. And I think when you look at how bad we were last year and how much we struggled, and I actually tried to look at just... I was furious, and I'm going to talk about the European game, but I was sort of apoplectic after the Bodo game. Oh, I saw, I saw, I saw your yeah. WhatsApp messages, mate. I know, I wasn't happy. <laughs> um, then, it, uh, upon reflection, I sort, of, I sort of thought about things, and I, I, I looked at a couple of the highlights from my last season games, and I thought, well, we've, we've came, we are streets ahead, we've, we've, um, we've came a long way. So, in a way, you know, when you think about which came before, and you compare it to now, we're still in a very good place. So that made me feel a little better about things. And to be fair, it was one of the black eyes me and you'd spoke about taking. We knew we were going to take a few black eyes this year, and, and that was one, and that's all it was. So so I feel a bit better about things now. But I'm glad that's why I was doing the, the aftermatch, because I was... I, I know. I, I, 
I found the aftermatch tough and it, it wasn't because of the 90 minutes I just watched. It's years and years of teams coming to Celtic Park, putting on a pair of slippers and getting a result in knockout games. And I was just completely fed up with it. And I was maybe a bit harsh on the team where we are as well, but it was just, I'd seen that, I'd seen that game unfolding many, many times before. And I'm just completely not scunnered with it. I'm probably psychologically damaged the amount of games over the last five years where average European teams or, or not top quality European teams come to Celtic Park and get a result while smoking a big fat pipe. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm just fed. I'm just completely scunnered with all of that. Eh? Eh, Martin O'Neill, three years away, does that make it a, a rat anniversary? That's, that's, that's quite a funny pair of words. I'm, I'm actually over Rogers leaving us now. I'm actually oh, over it. I'm actually over it. Which uh, I thank him for his time at Celtic, truthfully. And the, there is reasons that he left. Uh, and that's just what Edward Y of Oz actually says as, as well. Is Rogers to blame for missing out on ten in a row, Brian? I let you answer that first. No, no, I don't think so. I think the um, so. Rogers aside, the, the, the club was, was struggling for a while the, behind the scenes as we saw and, and I think there was a we spoke about it loads of times, so I won't go over it too much, but you can saw there was a real lack of ambition, real lack of organisation, real lack of structure, and there's a lot of problems behind the scenes that initially caused Rogers to leave and then ultimately it, it was a perfect storm of things. You had you know, law sort of interfering in the board, no really knowing what was going on, the no real infrastructure, Lenin sort of didn't really stand up to scrutiny this time, unfortunately. Um, the players sort of checked to the COVID. So there's any number of things you can you can take for that. Um, I don't think, I wouldn't give Rogers the credit to say that he cost us. Um, as much as I loved him when he was at Celtic, I don't think there was enough to say, or oh, his loss cost us that. It was far more important than, than relevant factors. And ultimately, it was, you know, there was so it was just a perfect storm. Oh, Siri's talking to me there. There was so many, um, it was just a, a perfect storm. I mean, Siri's telling me to shut up, still talking about Brendan Rodgers, but it was just a perfect storm of stuff going on at the time that no one person's to blame. Uh, there's, there's the one person to blame, but I'll actually blame the people who chased Brendan Rodgers out of the club. Because if you back Brendan Rodgers, Brendan Rodgers stays at the club for 10 in a row and 10 in a row happens. The fact the fact was that they they made sure that he, that that he did actually leave the club. So why well, so why he's not to blame for not getting ten in a row? His leaving played a major part in us not getting ten in a row. I I, I do truly believe that. Uh, Craigie Craigie White, what was Rogers' legacy? You you're never going to get your, his legacy as an on on as a was as an invincible treble. As an utter invincible travel, what do you think? I, I think yeah, that's, I mean, that's, can't, it's it's the same argument we, we had in the past about Wall. You, you have to look at the trophy cabinet and, and the success. And although it came at a, a long term course, as we sort of found out last year, you have to see his legacy is the fact we went an, an invincible travel and then get the travel again after it, quadruple travel. So you know that's that's something that I think maybe we've still got recency bias in that. I don't think we really appreciate how big an achievement those trebles were. And I think, you know, maybe in, in, in a few years' time, we'll look back and go, actually, do you know what? That was that was quite a special achievement. Um, so he, he's, the history is there to show what his legacy was. But in terms of long term, I mean, his teams, other than McGregor, is completely eradicated. I think most of the infrastructure of the clubs changed since he left. Um, it changed again, and it's a whole new team. So, you know, we're, we're, uh, what's important now is, is that Ange builds a legacy and we support him in that legacy and the stuff he's put into place over the next few years stays for the next 10, 15 years and we become a club of continuity and structure and we actually, managers can actually leave a, a long-term legacy and hopefully Ange will. I think that as well, eh? I mean, the, the, there's a couple of comments about Rogers. Uh, I'll take that one out and I'll go to Martin Bickett. Uh, Rogers was an egomaniac. Well, that could that's why he's probably a successful manager, I, I would say. Uh, 
Ed Mack, the board let Rodgers down. I, I agree with that. I think the board did leave uh, let Rodgers down. Sean Barlow comes in, uh, giving Rodgers Malumbu and Izzy rather than John McGinn and the, and the right back, which is the Italian boy, I can't, Castagna. Uh, he signed for 16 million. He was chased for me. That's true. And I'm going to go with Will Mc, McMullen here. Rodgers left us in a great position. I think he did. I think he left us in a fantastic position, which was gradually eroded over the next two seasons. And now we're, we're maybe only seeing green shoots of recovery because of the guy you've actually mentioned and Posta Coglu. Let, let, let's stop talking about Rodgers. Let's talk about ball and ball and gollies ended up going to Russia. We're, we're on the brink of World War Three, and we send ball and golly to Russia. Hope we yeah, do. No, he's, he's an undercover boss. He's going to go and solve it. Oh, ball, he's going to do his turn. Um, I listen, I don't think anyone's going to be that sorry to see the guy go, to be honest. Um, you know, even even if people were willing to give him a chance after sort of COVID gate last year when he was sort of let everyone down, he's obviously not had the attitude to, 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 to fake his answer. I think he's played him twice or something like that. He's, he's barely been in a squad, so it's no great loss. But what it is, hopefully, I mean, I know it's a loan deal at the end of the season. Hopefully, it's a loan to buy and, and we can get shot in permanently because. You bone decent wages, hopefully get a cut of quid from and it'll allow us to move on about a bit of breathing space. And then, you know, you're looking at maybe just a few other people to offload, but Paul and Golly. Um I remember actually there was a sort of when he first came, I remember all the Twitter posts and that they changed their name to some sort of Ball and Golly proxy. There was so much support for him and he, he sort of he was the first domino that fell, I think, when um when we started to see everything was falling apart. So he'll always be remembered for that, sadly. Um, best luck to him, I suppose. I don't know if they went to Russia, but maybe that's, uh, maybe that's a bit of karma for old Bolly getting uh, sent to Russia. I tell you, his agent must have sold that move to him <laughs> really, really well. For I will we'll send you to Russia, the new mate. It's going to be fine. Nothing's going right. to happen. I mean, the, 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 I don't the, worry about it, Bolly. It's, well, it's, it's, well, it's fine. It's fine. You'll still have gas and electricity and money. Don't you worry about stuff like that. I mean, that's fine. France WU, Castagne is Belgium, Kev. I, you're, you're right there, France. I actually meant he, he, he came fairly. He came for at, at Atlanta. Eh? That's, that, but I kind of kind of thought that. Martin O'Neill, I'm going to bring this one up. Eh, Bolly away is a NATO, a NATO envoy. <laughs> Hopefully, no. Hopefully, there's no... Eh, Distractions, shall we, shall we say, for Ball and Golly when he's across there? Um, let's before we get on to the football. I think we need to discuss VAR. The clubs are going to be discussing it in the next week. It was another controversial weekend. Um, I'll talk about our game. Uh, there was two controversial decisions in our game. One, not to give a penalty for Yakamak is getting elbowed in the cutting. And also Dundee claiming that they should have got a penalty in the last minute, which shouldn't have been a penalty because the rules actually state he headed it on his own hand, so it's not a penalty kick. Uh, if you look at the arrivals game just before that, I think there was five big de- decisions that Bobby Madden got absolutely wrong. So now our, our rivals are shouting about how poor the referees are and they want VAR. And all I would say to them is welcome to our world. Because that's been our world for decades, and it's not a it's a, it's a dark and lonely place. Uh, Brian, VAR's coming, no matter the cost. I think they're arguing whether it's going to be eighty grand a club or a hundred grand a club. Uh, I think that's the argument at the moment, but it is coming, and it should possibly be in for the start of next season. Yeah, I think it's needed. To be honest, um, I'd, I think. It's like the, the idea of VHR, uh, VHR, VHS, I was thinking about VHR, VHR. Is, uh, is ideal um, because it is supposed to help and get these decisions right. Um, it's the execution of it leaves a wee bit to be desired. I don't like when they score a goal and you have to take you know two minutes to decide if it's actually a goal. I think it can take the steam out of things a wee bit. But it's all, I always think it's dead funny when, when people get all their cells all excited and a twist about VAR coming in when a decision's went against certain clubs where in um, you know, Paul John has got a, a wee a wee book of the, the decisions that went against us this year and I think, you know, if other clubs had a look at that, they'd maybe reconsider shouting to line for it. In regards to the penalties, um in the Celtic Dundee game, I think the Juranovic one was a penalty as well, just before the, the Yakimakis one. 
Um, Yakimakis was an absolute stonewaller. I mean, he get belted right in the mouth. It was, it was just, you get a, a lie-in in the weekend for that. Um, so that means not only is that a penalty, but it's a red card to them. And then they're probably not in a position to get the ball in the box for Jota to head off his arm. So I think, you know, the, when you hear certain people shout about it, it always, mm-hmm. it always gives me a, a right smile. But I think it should be in. And I think there's teams that are going to benefit from it. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's teams that will, will really regret. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't think, you know, mm-hmm. we're not going to regret it. I think we we'll certainly benefit from some of the decisions that have went against us, especially this year. But as you say, in years gone past, it's, um, it's very interesting. And hopefully, you know, they will, um, they will stoke some of the whining. And maybe will, eh? And oh, we'll, we'll stick our hands up and, and admit this, Brian. We're very, very honest on this podcast and we'll, and we'll never back down. We'll never hide behind opinions and, and like what we actually say. But there is some goals this season that we've scored would have been chopped off under VR. We know that and we've actually been honestly eh, honest that, that, that we've actually said that and VAR will. It depends how it's used. I think you've actually seen it in England. The handball rule. VAR is not the problem with the offside and the handball rule. But it's actual rules themselves that are actually That's the problem. The and, and it, it, the, the worry for me is if we get it in Scotland, it's going to be the same people that made the decision, but they got a second look, so they've got, they've got a second chance to get it wrong. And um, I would suggest that might happen more often than not. Still, but you're right. I mean, I think there's times where it, it, decisions go for us, go against us. But like we've always said about rest, we're not looking for favours with anybody. We're just looking for consistency and fair play. And if we get that, I'm, I'm more uncomfortable that it's going to benefit us far more. You mentioned the Juranovic one. I never actually saw it, even though I was at the game, because the guy in front of me had, was standing up to go for a pie at the point and blocked my view of the, the Juranovic one. And none of the highlights have actually showed me the, the Juranovic one again. Uh, so I couldn't tell you if it was a penalty kick or not. Uh, but, the, uh, but the Yakamakis one was definitely oh. definitely a penalty kick. It was a stone wall penalty kick. Oh. Uh, even though more at the time I was more annoyed with Maeda missing the header. I thought he actually should have scored the header at that point, but it doesn't take away from the fact that the referee missed a stonewall penalty kick. Uh, fancy, I'm going to bring him back in. Ironic, VAR is mainly discussed when a certain team drop points. It is funny, that. It is really, really funny, that. There's been certain cheerleaders on certain broadcasters who have been screaming for it this season when certain decisions have went other teams' way, ways, and Mark comes in. Welcome back, Mark, a long-time viewer and listener uh, and contributor. VAR and England cost both clubs nine thousand pound a match. That's that's a that's a fair whack for Scottish football. Nine thousand pound a match, eh? Yeah, but again, I think it's something that's going to go in. I think you know, as it's, it's things move forward, and I suppose one of the arguments against VAR is the fact that it, it does take away some of the discussion around football because it is good to discuss these points and is that penalty, is it more penalty? It does add to the discussion, but all too often that discussion descends into bail and conspiracies and stuff like that and we could probably do without that. So I think nine grand's, they're just going to, as you say, Kev, I, I don't, I think it's going to be out, taken out of their hands. I don't think it's the um, the choice anymore. I think it's it's going to have to go in. Um but again, it's back to my earlier comment. It just, it's like, um, it's like it's Guinea refs this this new toy to play with. And it just, I don't know. I, I, I struggle to see what Douglas Ross maybe look at VR and give a, a good verdict. I think he could watch something a thousand times and get it wrong two thousand. So <laughs> he gets many things wrong, including in, in his in his uh, political career as well. But we won't. We won't. We won't. Yeah, yeah. But when they go down, we'll leave that to the state of politics with Patrick and Declan to actually talk about Douglas Ross's day job. Uh, the thing about VAR, I remember I, I watched a, a podcast by Anfield Rap, our friends Anfield Rap, and they were saying it's rubbish in the stadium, but great for TV viewers. Says because in, in, if you're in the stadium, you don't really know what's happening. Whereas you, if you're watching on live TV, you know exactly what's actually happening because it, you're getting a running commentary. Eh? So sometimes in the stadium, it's completely rubbish. And I must admit, there's some games where I've said about, oh, I've got all oh, this has gone to VAR now, and you're going, let's see what the and the television viewers get to see what the what the guys are looking at as well. Eh? And it's going to be going to be terrible. 
in the stadium when you're standing there going, well, what's actually going on? There's a lot of stadiums in Scotland didn't have big scoreboards to tell you this is going to a check and to show you the decision and stuff like that. I mean, that wee scoreboard at McDermott Park, you're lucky enough if that tells the right time and the right score. That never, never mind, never mind trying to actually tell you, oh, this is good. This is a VAR check. Eh? It is part of the wider package in this football as a massive entertainment. Eh? Yeah, I mean, I think with the VAR, I think the idea was get like the, so. I've been watching a bit of the Six Nations. Um, I'm not a huge rugby fan, but I, I like the Six Nations and um, the referees so good. Like. They've got their wee mates, and there's these guys at six foot ten, and there's these wee guys my size just telling them off. And they back chat. They've got their mates. They've got the VAR up there. They can see the results. They can make decisions on the spot. And I think that's the ideal. But it's so far away from where where we likely to be. I think. Um, but as I say, it's you, you have to wonder. I mean, the thing is, we still use some artificial pitches in Scotland, and we're talking about getting VAR in. So there's bigger problems to fix. To be fair, but um, I, I, I would imagine it would come in. It is, it is, uh, it, well, for me, it'll definitely come in. I reckon it'll eventually be a UEFA directive that uh, that needs to be implemented in, in leaks. Peter Calero uh, in Australia on the weekend, it took four minutes to determine whether a goal was offside. After two viewings, it was an obvious offside. The fans at the ground had no idea of why there was such a long delay. And I think, I think there is going to be stuff like that. When it does come in, there's got to be a lot of uh, a lot of quirks that are going to need to be ironed out. Well, I have spoke about entertainment, football being an entertainment. I see football as an entertainment, and whether we look at it, whether it is life or death or anything like that, the guys that sell the game to advertise or sponsor, and that is an entertainment. And Yakamakis came out with the entertainment at the weekend when he when he came out post match. And says reckoned that we would want, uh, that, that he reckoned that Celtic would win the league. This annoyed some no mark who used to play for Rangers at one point, and everybody had a view on it. Everybody, our WhatsApp group blew up with people going, "Folk, he shouldn't have says it," and folk going, "Well, why should they not say it?" See, for me, it's all part of the entertainment. That is all part of the entertainment. It's all part of the narrative that these players come out and actually say stuff like that. There's there's decades of proof of players coming out and saying stuff that they maybe shouldn't have ended up in saying. There's also decades of proof of players coming out and saying stuff that, were, that was proved actually quite right. I think this is a very Scottish-British thing that we didn't like players saying that. I, I watch a lot of the NFL, as the viewers will, will already know. They mic up the players and you hear the trash talk between the players. You see, you hear, you hear it in cricket and stuff like that. It just all adds to the whole story of the sport. And I think it's something, I, I think it's something that it's, it's British or Scottish football fans have just got to accept that it's part of the entertainment. It's part of the it's part of the game now, and and it's not something that we should go. Oh, didn't he say that because of some weird superstition? You're right. It's a very sort of. If you ask a senior grown, let me ask people this right: the people who are objecting to that level of confidence. See if you're going on a plane and you chat to the pilot beforehand, and you say, "Are you a good pilot?" And he says, oh, "I'm all right. I'm no bad." That's not what you want to hear. You want to hear that he's the best pilot available for the help you land that plane. In any sport, if you look at boxing, look at, um, I don't know if anyone's watched the, the Cannon and Brooks fight, their press conference was, it was all part of mine. I thought they were going to have a wee cuddle and a kiss at one point to get that close. They looked like they were going to fall in love. So it's part of mine. Sports is turning into part of mine now. It um, is. It's, like, it's like everybody talks about wrestling being it's scripted. Like wrestling, right? yeah, it's I mean, you know, if you don't, he became this this sort of panto villain and stuff, and I don't think there's anything wrong with about that. I think I don't want my I want my players to think the way Yaki Marcus does that we're the best, we're going to win, and I don't care what happens to anybody else. The discussion becomes: should they have said it in a public forum? So there's two ways to look at this. Where well, I think maybe he contradicted Ange, which was a problem because Ange said he had told the players he there was no mention of the Rangers result. Whereas Jacky Mack said, oh, I we on you. So that was poor because that kind of undermines the manager, makes the manager look a wee bit daft. But then but, again, but then, but I'm going to jump in before you actually go on there. Ange could be well correct, but somebody's told the players. It wasn't the Ange that told the players, but somebody else has told the players. I, I mean, it could have been the fans. The, the fans could have shouted at them during the game. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, 
Well, we, we haven't seen it as the best team. I think they're going to win the league. Somebody, somebody, a few people have said, oh, that'll be pinned up in the Rangers players' locker room. If that's what they need to motivate them, is champions to keep the league. There's more problems at Rangers than we can account for. If it takes them, so they go, hold on a second, lads. Do you hear what he said? He thinks they're the best. We should probably start playing now. That's utter nonsense for me. I don't buy that at all. I don't think that's extra motivation for them. And if it is, it should be because they're professional sports people and they are, unfortunately, the current champions. I have no issue with, with, with players coming out saying that. Is it embarrassing when it comes back to bite you if it goes wrong? Of course it is. John Kennedy done it last year, remember, before the, the Rangers game. And he said, oh, we are come for the best team in the league and I think we get scalped. So mm-hmm. it does happen. It happens to us all the time. You know, we've said something on the podcast and then somebody will remember it six months later and we get chinned for it. But it's all right. It's entertainment. It's it's sport. Um, just something you mentioned that I think would be good. So you talk about how we market our game here in, in the Scottish leagues. See if the players here are mic'd up. That would be comedy gold. Can you imagine some of the patter if, like, I don't know, our bros were playing Peter Heed? Some of the shouts the players to each other, some of the things the fans were saying. I would watch that. I would subscribe to watch that, no problem. See if you showed me League 2 in Scotland and all the players were mic'd up for a season, that would be great part of it. would be brilliant. So there's there's an avenue you could go because I think that'd be hilarious. The NFL do do it well. The NFL, the players are all mic'd up and it picks up everything and you hear like the NFL do a package like after after the weekend's game and you hear what players have actually said to each other on the touchline on the pitch and like you can't hear it in-game but you, but they actually do a bit after it, eh? And and it's or, or there's one of the players mic'd up. I think there's one of the players mic'd up in each team. I, I think that's the way it works. But it's it's great to actually watch, as you say, it's an entertainment, it's a pantomime at times. And if you didn't think that Sky do not have a look of what's the narrative that we're trying to drive here, what's the story that we're trying to tell? Or UEFA do that as well. You, you look at the story of the team that we're playing tomorrow night, Bodo Glint. They, their narrative is Arctic Circle, fairy tale, play great football, bet Roma. And that's what's getting sold. And that, that's what that's what the commentators are telling us. That's what UEFA are telling us. That's what the media are actually feeding. That's that's just a scripted narrative that's getting built to build up this tie even though we don't want to build up the tie, but that's it. Same with Sky Sports. How did they build up Burnley against Brighton? Oh, Sean Dice is under pressure, blah, blah, blah. They just they just attach a narrative, a narrative to it to give it that 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 weight, that story. And it's something, again, I, I think that's all Yaka Marcus has done. The big, the big lad's excited. He scored a hat-trick for Celtic. Somebody's asked him a question. Somebody's asked him a question in a press conference and he's went, well, I think we are the best team. And that's it. That's all he says. He says, he says, I'm confident I think we're the best team. That's like... It's a I'd say, back to the boxing analogy, if, if you know... Yeah, if you get into a title match and you say, oh, do you think they're going to win this title match? If it goes, oh, I'm not sure the guy's quite good, we'll see how I feel. The question going to knock him out in the fourth round. Whether you do or not, is it relevant? It's, it's the build up. And even we talk about showmanship and stuff, and we talk about Bodo game. As I say, I was apoplectic after the game. I was furious, right? I was in a proper huff. I actually feel like a couple of my pals at Rangers fans because I was lagging me. I took a big huff, right? But in June game, they were doing the huddle and they were doing the shushing thing when they scored and stuff. And do you know what? I'm all right with that. It's, it's, it's panel stuff. Because, you know, now you go, right, now we want to beat them. Now you want to be a bit of revenge. It just adds a bit of extra flavour to it. So I, I don't mind that sort of um, shed housery in football, I'm not swear. Um, I, I, I don't know how mind it either. I, I, I enjoy it. I think we're, we're at times, at, uh, I think we're at times guilty of taking football and sport in general far too serious. And stuff like that just adds a sort of element of fun to it. It g- gives it a bit of banter and it gives it a bit of context and other things that are actually happening in the world. And I just think it's just all part of the game, just the same as this is all part of the game. This is just like, this is. I mean, folk are spending an hour listening to it during lunchtime or whatever they're actually doing. They listen to it in the evening and that. It's entertainment. <laughs> they must find us entertaining or they don't listen to us. 
I hate but watching some people hate watch as well and just want to call his names for now, which is fine, don't you know? Ah, that, that's um, fine. I'm, I'm happy. If, that, if that's what gets them through the night, Brian, that's what gets them through the night. Brown Warriors, right? It's hype. Sky and everybody is just hype to actually get people to watch a product. And it does the, and if, I hate using that word product, product, but that's what it is. It really is just a product. Now, We've mentioned Yakamakis. Well, we well, we keep on with Yakamakis there. Eh? I mean, the big fella had sixteen touches, scored a perfect hat trick. That that's actually that's nine more touches than Roman Lukaku had for Chelsea at the weekend. Uh, sixteen touches, uh, sixteen touches, a hat trick. You can that's that's great. Eh? Also, Alan Morrison. Alan Morrison says that of the seven goals Yakamakis has scored, everyone's been with one touch. Every one of them's been instinctive. And it shows that's the type of striker he is. And see, if you want to see the lack of... I mean, Kyogo doesn't have a lot of touches when, when he plays. If you look at his touches all game, it doesn't actually touch the ball much, but he bangs in the goals. And Yakimakis, I think... Uh, well, I hate seeing things like back to him for the start, but I was hoping he'd become good. At, and I, I thought he needed a bit of patience. And, and he, he showed that I think he's, he's certainly... At this stage, the, the better option over Maeda, um, just purely because he's he's starting to buy the money. Looks as if he enjoys it. I think I don't know if he suits the, the way we play more than Maeda, but that presence in the box, you know, ruffling feathers, getting in people's way. He works so hard as well, and again, perfect hat trick. You can't argue with a big man, and um, he loved it. The, the soap off showed his muscles. Um, love all that stuff, um, but he, I think he's. You know, there's a reason Ange brought him in, and, and this is the reason he's starting to buy in the goals, and hopefully that continues, and hopefully it continues in, in Thursday as well. Definitely. Robert Wallace agrees with you. Yakamak is doing his best. This is Sparta impression at the weekend. If I had a rack like his, I would probably do this with my top off, but I, unfortunately, uh, and, and, thank, and thankfully for the viewers, I haven't, so I've got a jumper <laughs> <laughs> You're spot on. I'd be, I'd listen. I'd be at my top of Cappy on the streets. <laughs> Fair, play, Fair play. As I say, I says last week, I've got doubts, and I think, and I, I think I explained the reason why I've had doubts. And for me, trying to, when I mean, he had 16 touches of the ball, and I'm used to used to the strikers having more touches than that. But I'm just going to get used to that, and I can't argue about the big fella. I thought his first goal was great. The turning circle that you had in the first goal was that tight, and the technique was brilliant to actually have volley that ball at the back of the net. And who does they love a diving header? <laughs> a diving header is a great goal to score. It's the bravery of the header as well. There was no, because it was a, you know, kind of, it wasn't that far off the ground. It wasn't a leaping. And then they, and there we, we no thought of getting hurt or getting injured or any way he, he thinks things about. It's the good thing about me as well is I like when, if there is a bit of, a bit of feistiness in a game, if people are throwing in tackles, he's one of the first ones over to, to help defend his players and, and get in people's faces and stuff. And sometimes we lack a wee bit of aggression in that way. It's not always good, you don't lose your discipline, but um, I, th- I think he adds so much. Um, I do think he can be a wee bit inconsistent, but, you know, uh, the team can be, there's things where you can, if a player's had a bad game, you can criticise him. Like, no. you know, in the first leg, I thought Jota had a poor game. I thought Abada was rotten. But there's a whole lot of them had poor games. I've been waxing lyrical about those two for, for most of the year. So just because you can criticise somebody's performance doesn't mean you're writing them off or you hate them or you hope they fail or any of that nonsense. It's just an analysis at the time where they're at. At the start of the season, no many people were, were shouting and bawling about how great Ralston was. And with all eight words, every one of us is saying, wow, he's improved. So we can all change our mind. And it's only an opinion on the time. So calm down, everybody. I, th- I think for me as well, it's learning what Yakamakis is going to bring to the team. And it's learning what Maeda is going to bring to the team. And the only, the closest example, as, as I said last week, was Brat Pack. I can see a bit of I'm going to be frustrated at times with both of them. But no, Yakamakis has actually now proved with seven goals, seven instinctive strikers' goals. That's what he's going to bring to the team. If I expect him to pick up the ball, charge 50 yards and do an Edward, that's not going to happen. And I need to stop myself thinking that's what a Celtic striker needs to do. That's what Yakamakis needs to do. And it's just learning myself how to actually judge these players, how to actually support these players. Uh, 
my Maida as well. I, I think Maida's probably just in that we still set on in period. I, I think he is. I think he struggled on against Bodo, but again, he scored a great goal. He scored an absolutely fantastic he- header in the first leg. I think he struggled against Dundee on, on Sunday out wide. I don't think he'd done ve- very much out there. But then I ha- had a look last week and go, well, he scored a decent goal. He scored a striker's goal that we'd want a striker to score against Bodo. And you go, that bodes well. It does bode well. But you need to give these guys time to, uh, to actually bed in and, and see what they're actually going to bring to the team. And I think I think myself, I'm going to blame myself here. Uh, yeah, I'm guilty of, of anything comparing them to what's went before. And you can't, you can't do that. No, and I think to be fair as well, I think that it's the expectations have a choose part. Like at the start of the season, like you and I were both very, very excited about Ange, but we did think it was going to take a longer time before we got to a really good position. I said I didn't think we would win the league this year. I thought we would play well, but it might be a wee bit beyond us because of the amount of changes, because of new players bedding in. Now I'll be disappointed if we don't win the league. And I think you can apply that to the players as well because when new players are coming in, at first we're, we're patient and we sort of give them a bit of time, give them a bit of time. But because of Hatati, O'Reilly, Kyogo, Jota, the way everyone's, they've come in and hit the ground, you can't expect the same from Yakimakis, from Maeda. And you know what, everyone does it at different times. Gucci, we finally saw. So I think expectations are a lot higher than they maybe were initially. And I think that plays a part. So don't beat yourself up, Kev. No, you know no, right. I'm not going to be. Uh, no, no, I need, I, I, you need to learn. You need to actually question yourself why you've come come to these reactions. And uh, and I says last week I'd come to those reactions because I'm measured them against players that shouldn't be measured against, and like recent players in recent memory. And Yakamak has proved at the weekend what he can bring to Celtic. That that's what it is. But if he plays tomorrow night, and I think we'll just move on to tomorrow night since I've said that, if he plays tomorrow night, I don't expect to see him breaking 50 yards up the park trying to drag us out of defence because that's not his game. Uh, that isn't his game. And the game against Dundee, I was actually confident, I was actually confident against Dundee that we were going to get a, that we were going to get a winner. The reason being that we were putting too many decent balls into the box for Yakamakis eventually not to get on the end of one of them. And he, he did actually get on the, the end of one of them. What I, what I did kind of... I mean, it was different from the Dundee United game and the Ross County game where I didn't actually see where the winning goal was actually going to come from, where, where the winner was going to come from. I was sitting away about 70 minutes, 75 minutes, going, we are going to get one big chance here. And we are going to take it because we're putting in so many decent balls into the box, which was something that we didn't do against Bodo on the Thursday night. The first decent ball we put into the box, Maida actually managed to score a good header onto the box. Against Dundee, I was always confident that winner was actually going to come. And maybe that's a sign where Ange Postacoglu has took us, eh? That I'm going, we are going to get one big chance now, whereas previously... At the start of this season, I'm going, I don't know where these chances are coming from. Yeah, I think you're spot on. I think but that's been that's been earned over a, a period because you can see that Andrew's built a, a resilience into this team. You can see the players believe they're going to win. It reminds me of, um, I've mentioned that a bunch of times, but I was a massive fan of Gordon Stanton Celtic team. And every I always felt they were going to get a late-minute winner. I always felt they were going to get a last-minute winner. Every single time they played, no matter what the result, always felt their score. Um, and I think the same way Ange always think like we're going to win this game we've got a real real strong mentality even when we're playing poor you can see they're going to bring something out and I hope that you know we seem to we seem to always react very well to challenges and sort of setbacks and I think the Bodo Glimp game on Thursday is a real good opportunity for us to sort of correct the record and whether we progress or not I think it's important to go over there performing in time win because we were Bodo basically done Ange all better than Ange against us. You know, they, they and I know they are they're about four years into their project compared to our first year, but they they played against us the way we play against other people and they really smiled us out and I don't think the stats show we were only as bad as we think they were, but we need to sort of adapt to that. And you know, we showed it against Bayer Levin Cousin when they scaled us at Parkhead for nothing, we still played quite well. And we went over there and we gave them a real fight and probably if we did a bit fitter, would have won that game. 
So what we need to do is go right with that, a, a sore one in the face with a Odo. Let's go over there, prove we can beat them, prove what, what they're no a better team than us. If we go through, I'll know that's a different story in the amount of goals, but I would take a win at the moment and then see where we go um, after that. And I mean, I've checked spot on. Um, they've had four years at it and they recruit very well. And they've got the thing that I've been crying out for. They've got consistency and structure. So they want to say they just to fit a system. They play that way all the time. No matter how many players they lose, they've got a database and a, a scouting system set up that when a player comes in, they just hit the ground running. That's why they're left back. Um, Who's actually a right back? He's actually a right back. He's um, actually a right back, aye. He was Declan who was saying yesterday they've only just signed him. And mm-hmm. I thought he was tremendous. I, th- I thought he was a new standout. I was going for us to sign him before I realised they've only just signed him. But that's the reality and that's why I know it's just sort of tangential, but that's why it's really important for Celtic, as we spoke about at the start, that there's a legacy that Ange leaves. And no matter who comes in in many years' time after him, or what players come in, they just fit that right away and can start, much the way Hatati and O'Reilly have done. Definitely. And we may as well move to Europe and we'll move to the tagline of what you're actually saying. Uh, what you're actually saying there, because it'll bring me on to Hatati and O'Reilly and, and the guys that, that guys that we've brought in. And I'm going to bring up Tommy R. Uh, he, he made this comment right at the start. That strap line about forgetting Europe is truly depressing, parochial or what? I tend to agree, Brian. I know me and you are on the same train when it comes. You actually plan for Europe and the league will take care of itself. Now, that's the way, that's the way I look at it. You build a team to compete in Europe, you, you will dominate the Scottish League if you build a team to actually compete in Europe. You build a team to actually win the Scottish League, that's all you'll do. You'll just win the Scottish League. And I think I think we've got previous, I think we've got evidence of that in the last five years. I do think we've got evidence of that. We built a team just to be a minuscule ahead of the rivals, which was just to actually take there was there was never there was never a an ambition to actually do well in Europe. And I think Ange Postacoglu is bringing that ambition to do well in Europe. I mean, look at it. We don't want to be in the third tier of European football, but that's where we are. Whether we should be there after being knocked out of two competitions is another argument that we could have all day. But we're there and we want to, and we want to actually win the tie. And this is what really annoyed me uh, last week. It wasn't the 81, 81 minutes of a tepid performance that can happen in football. It wasn't uh, the fact that this team were back, back pocket us at Celtic Park. It was the fact as we scored to get back into the game. We scored to get back into a two-legged tie. And you're going and, and you begin looking at it, you're going like that. This game finishes up, finishes up 2 1. We've still got another tie here. And if we go to Norway and be the best version of ourselves, we have got a chance of getting through. That third goal kills the tie because you're then looking at it, you're then going, we need to score three goals without them actually scoring. You look at our, our recent history in Europe under Postacoglu, we didn't really keep too many clean sheets. So you're going, that seems highly unlikely it is going to happen. So then my thinking is now, going into this game tomorrow night, is it's a free hit. We've got nothing to lose apart from go out and win this game and see what happens. Start the game on the front foot and hopefully we get ourselves in with a chance of taking the game into extra time. Uh, uh, or or winning the game but it's a free hit for us because of that third goal that third goal on paper and in the bookies and that killed this tie and I'm really annoyed about that I'm annoyed about that 30 seconds and also I spoke about I spoke about the storytelling of football the fairy tale of, of, of Bodo Glint as well and we're, we're just part of that fairy tale Sometimes you have a look at it and you go, the football gods are not looking at us because that ball could have defended across the bar. It could have been out for a shy. It could have been right up the park. But it ended up going into the back of the net. And sometimes you just go, maybe this just wasn't meant to be to get through this time. Yeah, so I've got some thoughts on this. Um, if, for a start, just on the actual tagline, Angie's never going to forget about Europe. It doesn't matter what game... He's playing, he's never going to say, oh, do you know what, we'll give this a bang, prioritise the league. I don't think that, that's his mind. Whether it should or not is a different argument, but I think that if you've got a winning mentality, you don't forget, you don't go, right, 
don't worry about the cup games, don't worry about this game, we'll just focus on the league. Because see when you do that, that that's a weaker mentality. See when you say, you know, we, we, can, we can only do one. We can't compete in Europe and win the league, so we'll just prioritise the league. If you start thinking like that, that, I think that's a weak mentality. And I don't think that's a winning mentality. And by extension, I don't think you win the league anyway. I think you, you go out there and you, you correct the mistakes of last week. As I said earlier, I don't think we'll go through. I don't know if we'll, we'll go there and win 3-0. I think we'll concede probably. But I think we, should, we need to win the game. And I think we need to play a strong side to win the game. And I think that corrects. So it's obviously got to go out. But you restore a bit of pride and you go, right, you know, we, that was a blip. And you move on. And you take that mentality into the rest of the games of the season. It's like the Scottish Cup. If you start writing off Europe all season, they would then say, well, why bother playing the Scottish Cup? Let's put, uh, put the, the kids in country in the league. That doesn't foster the mentality needed to win, I don't think. It's not the mentality that Ange has. I don't think the mentality he wants in the team. So I wouldn't sacrifice anything. I wouldn't. I, would, I, I don't think success in one field has to be mutually exclusive. I think, you know, Ange said it for the start. Anytime he's in a competition, he wants to win it. And I think that's the right mentality. And I think it's the right mentality for Celtic. And I agree with you. You said it a number of times. If you're Bodo Glynn, despite their, their small stature as a club, other than by Leverkusen and Betis, our best team we've played this year. Definitely. Obviously, by, a, by, a, by a distance. So you need to compete against the best. Because what you want this time next year is that we're putting teams like this out comfortably. And if we're doing that at that level, the league takes care of itself. Everything domestically takes care of itself. But if you only focus on the league, what's going to happen is you just all you need to do is be better than two or three other teams in the league. But those teams are as good as the teams you need to move forward as a club. So Europe should always progression in Europe should always be a priority for me. I think that's how the team gets better, and by extension, we can you know have a clean sweep domestically. And I think Anne shares that. Uh, the only point of discussion I would suggest is do we play different players in in consider resting players I don't necessarily think we should because I think I think we need to correct I think we let ourselves down as a team and I think I'm hoping the players will be desperate to prove a point and go over there and win so I think we give them that chance and then that momentum rides into the rest of the year I think what we've seen for Poster Coglu that any changes that he makes he doesn't see it weaken on the side he puts out a side to win the game and what he'll be, the side that he puts out tomorrow night will be a side that he believes can actually win the tie, never mind the game. <laughs> and because that's the, the, that's the attitude that he will go in it, go into it with. Because you have a look at the whole, his whole ethos when he talks about performance. He says, sometimes we don't look at the results, but we look at the performance. And if you, if you get to a certain level of performance, the results will follow. Now, I think since the first half in Aberdeen, we've not really hit heights that we, that we had against Rangers and Hearts. I think that I think that's fair to say. And I think Ange Postacoglu will be looking at that as well, and he'll be looking to try and get his players back to playing to that level of performance that we actually seen earlier on. And tomorrow night's another another game where we can actually do that. And I'm I'm never writing off Europe. I'm never writing off a game. I think first and foremost we need to win that game tomorrow night and see where it takes us. If we get a decent performance tomorrow night and we might fall short, I mean we have got it is it'd be highly unlikely for us to actually get through that tie. But if we go through there, player player football, show our identity, have a decent performance, that board. Bodo's as well. See what I did there. <laughs> that bodes well for going into Easter Road on Sunday. That gives the players the confidence again that they've done a decent performance, and we're going into a, another tough, tough game on the Sunday. And it's all it's all about performance. Where Ange Postecoglou and and even the the Bodo players have been talking about. We talk about performance. We didn't talk about. We didn't actually talk about results. We talk about how we perform, and they were highly ruthless at Celtic Park they were really really ruthless at Celtic Park whereas we were a bit toothless and we had that 30 seconds I think put the tie out of put the tie out of reach tomorrow night tomorrow night I think there's a there's a big call to make and I'm going to make this call I'm going to make it at this precise moment in time I think tomorrow night's a game for near beat on to come in and sit as a defensive midfielder and, and 
Callum McGregor moves further forward. And then you've got a choice of three to play the, the, the other number eight role. You've got Atati, O'Reilly and Rogic, who, if we're being extremely truthful, where everybody have been off form for the last few games. So Ange has actually got a toss of a coin, what ones that he actually puts in the number eight. But I see tomorrow night and Sunday being a game for near beat on. So it's hard to disagree. Um, <clears throat> the only thing I would say is, I think the, the biggest thing we missed against Bodo was energy in the middle of the park. Like Callum here was trying to do two people's jobs, he was trying to do Rogers covering and his own. So uh, the most amount of energy you get probably is O'Reilly, Hitati, McGregor. That being said, Bodo were really physical. They, they, you know, physically they were very strong as well. So having Beaton in there would provide a bit extra physicality. And if we move, say, Callum Ford and I would have Fatati in, they could do a bit of the running. And, you know, if we've got our fullbacks jumping in, Beaton could actually slide back into a back three if we need to, if we're pressing, without getting exposed because we were cut open a couple of times. So I don't think that's wrong. Do you want to hear my controversial pick on the, uh, the team? So I would have... Ralston, CCV, Starfield, Taylor. I'd probably agree with you about Beaton, Hatati, McGregor, Iranovic, Gigi, and Jota. And here's why, right? So the reason I've pushed Iranovic up is because we need to occupy their left back, or the guy explaining it, left back, because he was a massive outball for them. I don't think putting Jota in the right is going to do the job because then your left is exposed and we don't have an actual winger in the left now and we need one. So I think Juranovic would also help doubling up if he needs to track back and interchange with Ralston. I think Ralston has proven with his assists in terms of balls into the box and he's, he's passing. He's, he's a really good you know, weapon to have. I think Juranovic is a better crosser than Abada. So if he's at right, that would help. Um, I also think Ralston's better maybe suited to the physicality and the doubling up the reason I would have Taylor back in I thought Taylor had a shocker the other week but it's a much better balance for an actual left back at left back you could argue Scales comes in but I think Taylor's got the attitude where he's got something to prove so that's why I would have him in and then Jota left so that would be my controversial pick I don't think he'll do it but um I think I think you'll stick with the the team. I think you you'll stick with Abada, Gigi, Jota, and McGregor, Hatati, O'Reilly, Taylor, CCB, Starfield, uh, Juranovic. I think that's the team you play, but it's not the team I would play. It's not the team that I would play either. But I'm going to spot. I'm just going to bring up this comment. Ongly, Kevin, <laughs> you are talking nonsense. You need to hear that. Who's your hate watcher? Uh, you need to be a bit more specific because we've been on for 52 minutes and I've spoke nonsense for the 52 <laughs> minutes. So you, so, so you need to be a bit more specific on what part I was actually talking uh, talking nonsense. I, th- I think he's actually from the dark side, actually having a look at some of the other comments that he's putting in. So there we go. Yes, those are fans, I'm I, I'm going to bring up uh, Peter McDonald's comment. Can we go over a debate reg- regarding Juranovic at left back? Now, I'm going to agree with Peter here. I don't think Juranovic works at left back. And the team that you put out there for me doesn't actually work either with Juranovic further forward because I think it's extremely clear that Juranovic is the best right back at the club and the team loses something when he doesn't play at right back. Granted, he had a poor game against uh, last Thursday. He did have, a, but there was eight or nine of them had, had, had poor games last Thursday. I think Juranovic has got to play right back and should no, no longer be looked at to be playing any other di- any other position unless we are we've got an injury crisis like we did have when he played the right wing position again again against St Mun uh, before Christmas. Eh? Juranovic is the best right back at the club. I think on Sunday as well, we lost something with him at left back. He just get, that left hand side didn't work on Sunday with Juranovic playing left back. And I think moving him further further up, as you says, Brian, would just cause more problems where we want to be as fluid as possible in this game, right for the start. Possibly. The, the reason that 
So I kind of agree with Peter in that I don't think Juranovic is great at left back. However, I think the reason the team doesn't work as well is because we don't really have any quality left-footed wingers. Maeda isn't a winger for me. So I think even with you know a balance there, it doesn't doesn't really work. Jota's a right winger. So if you've got Juranovic in the left and Jota in the left, both right footed cutting in, it's too predictable. Um <clears throat> I think Taylor adds better balance to the team. But I, I, so what's the best way of making this concise? I think Juranovic at left at, at left back can be better than Taylor, but Taylor works better in the team because of the dynamic. Because if you look at who's in front of them, I think the reason Juranovic played badly um, the other night was because a bad offered nothing. And I know if he got a bad, I just on that night he offered nothing. That's why I think just a wee change of attack might work. Um, so I, I don't think Juranovic is bad at left back. I just think we lack on the left side in general. So when you take probably the only, I think we've only got two left footed players in the squad, haven't we? We've only really got um, skills. Taylor and maybe Hattati, I don't know if you've got you need a balance in the team. I mean Starfield, he gets criticised for his passing and after that, but he's playing left centre back and he's right footed. If you got a right back there as well and you've got a left winger who's also right footed, that's where the problems lie. So I don't think it's just position specific or player specific. I think it's team specific. So that's a long-winded answer. Yeah. No, 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 I can't, I can't, I can't exactly where, where you're going with it. I says in the post-match last week, last Thursday, that I reckon the system completely failed and it was quite hard to be tough on individuals to say, by the way, you had a poor game because I think the actual system just did me work all night. And I think that, that and, and maybe now I'm actually going to pick on individuals now I actually think about it, but I think there's been a drop off in the performance levels, especially in the midfield, especially in the guys that we brought in, especially in Atati and O'Reilly. They're, they're beginning to look like the adrenaline has now worn off and they're going to need to be managed a bit better. And this is why, Lou, I'm sitting here knowing that Neil Beaton's got a yellow card in him. He's actually got a sending off in him. He's got a tug in him. He, he, he's got he's got a brain fart in him because he's done it. He's done it in the nine year that he's been at Celtic. There's been games where he's ended up doing something completely stupid and ended up getting sent off and costing the team. But I'm looking at the squad. Ida Gucci's not in the European squad, and I'm going. We need. Some, they overran that midfield last week, so we need to bring in a certain type of player to solidify that middle of the park and the only person that we've got in the squad that's able to do that is near Beaton and it takes out the possibility of having two players that are maybe now finding their feet at Celtic as in Atati and O'Reilly in the same midfield or Rogic who we were saying a few weeks ago was in the best form of his career but since the Rafe Rovers game that sort of, his form has sort of dipped a bit so you're having a look I'm having a look and go, how do I get guys in that middle of the park which I know that will give me a 7, 8 out of 10 performance? And that's how I'm bringing in beat on. And that's how I'm bringing in beat on and McGregor. On the other one, I've actually have wrote doing a tie. I have actually wrote doing a tie because I think he's a bit more mobile than O'Reilly and uh, Rogic and that's only the reason Hattati for me is getting the nod in that position but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if Ange picked O'Reilly or Rogic in that position I, 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 I wouldn't really but if I'm looking at this game I'm playing Hattati in that position Yeah I just think Rogic is good he's been he's no he's not got the energy to press the way a Hattati is or even an O'Reilly or a McGregor has um, just for clarity by the way I know we've got left 50 players in the squad but I, I meant specifically in the wider areas mm-hmm. um, but I, look, see whatever team we play tonight and against Hibs on Sunday they should be capable of winning there's not so you know it almost it's picking the right team for the for the, for the, the opposition and that's the most important thing as opposed to the players themselves because I think different things would you, this is just an interest, you know, we're running out of time, but against Hibs, if we if we say we play a, a regular starting 11 against Bodo, would you put Julian in against Hibs? Now, I know starting Sunday for 90 minutes, just back there, isn't it great, but given our weakness at set pieces in the past few games, and the amount of crosses we're putting in the box, would the Hibs game be a good opportunity for him to step in? Or would you stick with CCB and Starfield, regardless of 
Thursday? For me, from now to the, start, the end of the season, our back four has to be Juranovic, CCV, Starfell and Taylor. Keep from, it uh, to, 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 to keep it continuity, to keep it tight. Um, I, I noticed some folk questioning Joe Hart, and it's, it's, it's an interesting question, uh, saying that he should be organising his defence a bit better and maybe coming out for some of the, the balls. The two games, the two goals that we lost against Dundee and the goals, the three goals that we lost against Bodo Glunt, I was they actually saying that they were the goalkeeper's fault, but I do think there's got to be a continuity in that back five. Uh, where's uh, Michael Curranham? Will this game, will this be the game where we see Jul- Julian return to the back four? I can't see Julian playing on a plastic pitch tomorrow night. I can't see that whatsoever. I'm not sure that team as well. They're too good for your first game, Mark. I think. I, and, I, and, and I can't see it. If if if, uh, if Julian plays to plays tomorrow night, then it shows that uh, Ange Postecoglou is prioritising Easter Road. For me, that, that that is a that is that is a selection, which goes. Man, he's prioritising Easter Road, which I don't think he'll do. That's why I think we'll get the back five tomorrow night. Hart, Juranovic, CCV, Starfelt, and Taylor. My midfield is beat on McGregor, Atati, and up front is Jota, Yakamakis, and Abada. Even though I think Maeda might be a better fit playing away from Europe, we cannot drop a striker. It's just scored a hat trick at the weekend. No, and to be honest, I think I think over there, you know, big big Jack Marcus is battering me about for for an hour, and then Mieda comes on and runs it. Even your legs are tiring because he did start to camp up against us. You know, they did they did fade a wee bit. I think that's a a, a better shout having Mieda off the bench for his pace. Um, yeah, so uh, I can definitely kind of drop double G no chance. I think Double G gets the chance, but then when we then when we look at Sunday, for me, I think there's a question mark where a, where a Double G gets a, gets a start on Sunday. I think you might actually see Maeda coming in for that, and I've also like got a wee question mark over the number eight again. I think you might see a, a says a title start as a number eight with McGregor. But I think at Easter Road you might actually see O'Reilly or Rogic starting. Rogic seems to love playing against Hubs. So that seems to be where he'll start. But I do feel tomorrow night, if if Ange is going to seed anything whatsoever in the middle of the park, then it's, it's beat on, it's coming in for a more defensive option. Possibly. I, I do think we see changes for Sunday just because, you know, they're going to be playing a hard game away in Europe on a Thursday night. I'd imagine you'll freshen up for Sunday. Um, so we'll see. We'll see if my crazy pick has any sort of merit. Or if it's just me talking nonsense, um, I think you pick your strongest team the Thursday though, and then um, maybe make a couple of changes for for Hibs. But I think logic's more suited to domestic because he, he doesn't need to press as much, and you can get other people doing the work for him. I think against um, Bodo, we'll need everybody working as hard as possible. It, it definitely, and I, and I do think at Easter Road. When you look at what Rogic has done against Hibs this season, I think Roger, Rogic gets the nod at Hibs, but not tomorrow night. No, that's that's just that's just the way I'm I'm looking at it. Now we've been on for an hour and three minutes. Thank thank you for everybody that's actually watched. I'll bring in a, a couple of a couple of comments to finish off. Strange love the doctor. It's a two goal advantage. Not much with ninety minutes to play. That's the way that we've got to look at it, Brian. It isn't much when you look at it that two nothing is not a is. Two nothing is not a great advantage. Where two goals is not a great advantage with ninety minutes to play. Even if it's not an each after sixteen, you score. You give Bodo an actual. You give Bodo a, an actual question to answer. You, you make their minds doubt. And that's all I want to do tomorrow night. Give them. Give put a bit of doubt into their mind and give them a game, which is something we didn't actually do last week. Brown Warrior again. Uh, and isn't forgetting Europe. He's taking each challenge as it comes, as we both says. Any the eleven that goes out on that part tomorrow night will be a will be the team that Ange Postacoglu believes can win the tie. Never never mind the game, and that will be the same at Easter Road on on Sunday. He will believe that the eleven that he puts on the pitch is the team that's best suited to actually win that game. Uh, as Brian Rob Brian Roberts comes now, I think it should be Ange. I think it should be Ange to be asked that question. I think he would say, I want to win everything, mate. He would, Brian. I think he's already actually said that. Uh, David Bradley, 
Yakamaka is going to be massive for us, Kev, for the run. He's confident now. He is very, very confident now. And hopefully he bangs in a couple of goals more a night. And I'm going to come with Stephen McDonald here. Kevin, 11 games. Doesn't matter what happens tomorrow night, Brian. We have 11 cup finals left. 11 domestic cup finals left. And that's what we need to remember no matter what happens tomorrow night. There's life in the old dog yet, no matter what happens in Europe this season. And we've got a massive 11 games, which we will be covering on a Celtic state of mind. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you for the comments. These are absolute top lads. And hail, hail. Thank you.